Yo, yo, yo. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Best Practices Show, where we bring the best thinking from all of dentistry and share it with you. And today is an awesome episode where I interview Dr. Zach Sisler, and we talk about what the resistance is behind trying something new, and we dissect it, and it is fantastic. So listen to this as he shares some insight on some of the things that he gave up and how he had to work through some of those things to see brand new horizons. So hope you guys enjoy the episode. We'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show, where we're always looking to see how we can bring you some value and make you better. That's what this podcast is all about. My job is to bring you the best minds in dentistry and hopefully give you some insight and some help, and it makes you better and ultimately makes your practice better. And today is no exception. I got a good friend of mine, Dr. Zach Sisler, who's genius on a lot of things. And today we're gonna be talking about the whole idea of trying something new and why you don't and how you might wanna work through that because the more you try, you're gonna find it works and it makes your life better and all of those things. So Zach, how you doing, brother? It's good to see you. I'm good, Kirk, thanks for having me. Oh man, I'm so pumped. Now, I, if you guys have been listening, if you're a new dental student listening, you, you know how this works. I always want to welcome you to a very inviting community. I also want you to know who you're listening to. I'm not that important, but I want, Zach, tell us your story. Tell us, tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and where you practice. All right. My name is Zach Sisler. I practice in a little town of uh, Shippensburg, Pennsylvania, which is kind of out in the middle of farm country in central PA. Um, I have a cosmetic restorative implant driven practice in this tiny little town. Um, but that's just one side of the equation. The other side is I'm a dad who has four kids. Ages are eight, six, four, and two. So needless to say, when I do leave the office, I am basically turning into an Uber driver and taking into all sorts of extracurriculars. So it's a busy time in the practice, but it's also a very busy time once I leave the practice. So yeah. um, rest is very little in our house, but we're uh, keeping our heads above water. So that's yeah. kind of us in a nutshell here lately. Yeah. Now, can I just ask you about that? Because you didn't know I was going to ask you. You know, you and I both have four kids. Your kids are early in the journey. Mine are a little bit late. But let's talk about the reality. That's one of the things I really like about you. You're very real. And building a great dental practice and building a great family, they compete. They compete for resources and energy. And it's very real. Like, can you just give us some insight? If I'm a young dentist listening and I'm just having a few babies, like, Zach, help me out. Help, what did you, what have you, what are you doing right now that's working or not working? Give us some, some insight. So the one thing I would say when it comes to practice and kids is there's never a perfect time for either one. Um, because <clears throat> when my wife and I were getting ready to have our first child, I had just taken over a practice, uh, six months prior to it. And I was driving an hour each way to work. Now, don't get me wrong, we were striving to get more in balance than that, but we just realized if we kept waiting and waiting to have a child, or we kept waiting to buy a practice, or we get, if you kept waiting, you're just waiting for things to pass you by. Mm -hmm. So for us, we were like, all right, this is just gonna be life, and this is just gonna be how we roll. So we uh, had our, we had my son that first year of practice, we slowly got moved down closer to where we're, um, to where I practice now, so my drive's only 20 minutes, but that didn't necessarily uh, slow the pace down of things because obviously we kept having kids and I would encourage anybody just to look. We had somebody tell us one time, you're always at your max. So when I was with one kid and I was driving an hour one way, I was at my max. I didn't know how we would do it with another one. And then we had three more and here we are. And so now it's a new max. We learn to adapt. We learn to kind of figure out new routines. But for us, one thing that we've, that we, and I've been doing a lot more of here lately is being much more diligent with my time, uh, finding 
what I need to do to keep us successful at the practice, but also at home. Yeah. And it can be little things like um, you're, I know you're reading Atomic Habits right now too. So one little thing I realized that in the, in the grand scheme of my day, there's really only one good time for me to work out. And that's before I go to work okay. and I don't enjoy working out and I don't enjoy working out extra early in the morning, but I do realize that once I come home and again, I turn into that Uber driver and I'm running all around, there's not really a good time, but I know myself needs, I, I need that for the balance. I need that for my mental health. I need that for my physical health. I just little things like that. I've had to learn to adapt. And yeah. I think if, if anything, <laughs> teaching kids, if anything, having kids teaches you to do is you have to be able to learn to adapt to the situation. Amen, brother. Now go, go back to that. Give us a little insight. So, cause I know a little bit about your schedule working out in the morning just isn't like a little bit in the morning. Can you give us a, some perspective on your dental schedule and what your workout schedule looks like? So it was probably, uh, I was trying to think of how long ago this was. I heard this awesome uh, practice management guy talk at my local dental society and my whole team was there. And he said that there's nothing good that happens in a dental office after three o'clock. And so my team looked at me, we made the shift and we've never looked back. So we work seven to three straight through each day um, with no lunch. And so that means working out to me is at 5 a.m., which okay. I do not enjoy, but it is what it is. I get up, I work out for about 45 minutes and then get myself ready, wipe, wipe the rest of the sleep out of my eyes and get to the office in time to see patients by 7. By so seven. we have a little morning huddle before, so I have to be there, you know, 10, 15 minutes early. But. Okay. And just to clarify, you're working Monday, you're not working, you're working four days a week, right? Four days, Monday to Thursday, seven to three. Okay. Seven to three. Okay, cool. That's really good insight. You know, cause a lot of times people talk about this, but like, I, I actually want to know, it's one of my favorite things. And we should probably do a whole series on this. Like, take me inside a whole day of your life. Like, what does it look like? What do you eat? You know, and I was just talking to Kevin Growth beforehand. And he's like, man, I, we're all trying to think about how we eat healthier. And I'm like, keep a ton of almonds at the office. Like I'm doing the whole fasting. Uchi has me doing the, and my wife doing the fasting thing, but like, it's crazy how almonds, and I hated them at first, but they satisfy you when you're starving, you know? So that's, that's for another show, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's really helpful to see how this all works because for kids, I totally agree with you. You know, one of the things I would always tell myself is surrender when I go, surrender to what's going on, like surrender, just get involved And in my, I, you know, I like being the boss at work, but I also, my wife is very much the boss at home. And so she's usually got a sheet of paper and saying, okay, you're going to go here, go there. And just talking to the kids in the car. And you can't do that if you don't get a lot done during the course of the day. And so I love what you're talking about. And, you know, before we hit the go button, you know, you brought up a great topic to talk about. And it's the whole idea of why people are so scared to try something new. Now I could sit here and go, Oh yeah, it's so easy. But the truth of it is I'm 51. I've been doing this for 25 years. I hate change. I, I like the idea of change, but take us in and now remind our listeners, how old are you too? Like how old are you right now? I'm 37. Okay. You're 37. Let's talk about the why of that topic. Why did you pick that topic and why is it so important at this stage of your game? Um, so for me, I think the reason that this is important is because when I first came out of school, I was super hungry. And I mean, I took every course under the sun. I wanted to try everything. I wanted to really ramp my practice up. And then I think once you get to a point, to where things are going somewhat smooth and you do have some good systems in place, you sort of almost get on this autopilot and you're like, all right, well, I could just coast here. You know, I could just kind of relax, ride this out for the rest of my career and be done. But realistically, I think we owe it to our patients. We owe it to really our teams and ourselves as well to not become stagnant. Yeah. And, you know, at 37, I've been out of school 12 years now. And so I still feel very much like I'm in my prime kind of production years, but also my prime physical years, mm -hmm. mental years, you know, like I'm not, my back isn't fully deteriorated yet from doing this 25 years. Yeah. So I feel like even though I feel pretty good and I'm like kind of smooth and not sorry, kind of uh, things are going along pretty smooth. 
I still feel like if I'm not constantly pushing myself or being like a continuous learner to try something new, then I just slowly dwindle away or I become not as relevant or I become almost more of a fixed mindset rather yeah. than a growth mindset. Love and that's it. a little, that's a little scary to me. Yeah. So now let me go back to one other thing you said, cause I'm, I'm taking notes here and you guys should be too, if you're listening. So I love what you said earlier. You always feel like you're at your max. So let me play the 32 year old Dennis is like, Zach, I'm totally with you, but I'm maxed in my practice. Like I want to try things new. Help me out. What what would you say to the 32 year old Dennis? Who's thinking that right now? So my thing I would be saying is, what are you doing that you don't need to be doing that's causing you to feel this maxing? Love because it. to me, I, you know, when I was 32 and I was still trying to hold every, I was, I feel like I was trying to hold the whole practice together, you know, with a piece of dental floss almost. Um, and to a degree, there was a lot of things that I had to let go. And I, and I probably should have let them go a lot earlier, you know, maybe certain things I did in the office procedure wise, or maybe there were certain admin things yeah. that I just still had Wait, my grips on. Now go back to that. Anything, anything in mind? Like, is there one thing that you gave up that you're like, Oh, I'm so glad I'll, I'll volunteer first. I would spend hours on QuickBooks, like trying to get it all right. Like, but it was three hours after the kids went to the bed and I was, I was set on getting every, and then I gave it to a woman named Barb and she could do it faster. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can sleep now. Is there anything that comes <laughs> to your mind when it comes to getting rid of, was there a pivotal thing that you gave away? So there was a, there was a couple of things that I consider pivotal for me that I was, I didn't realize how much was, it was creating how much of a time suck it was. Okay. One, I took the office email off of my computer and all personal devices. So if you want to get in touch with me, you can only get in touch with me through a personal email. Because what I would do is I would be, an email would come through and I would start to answer it. And I would start to be thinking about that for the next day. And I, could, would, and I couldn't uh, let it go. And then I would be starting to troubleshoot it before I ever walked in. And I just realized that I have a really good team at the front desk who handles that. And I don't really need to micromanage all of these little emails that come into the office. And then I didn't have to think about it. I was able to kind of like do how you did. I was able to surrender when I walked out of the office because I, I really wasn't going to be contacted unless there was an emergency. Love that. The second, the second thing I did um, was I started incorporating my assistance into more of the procedure. I was very much under the inkling, nobody can make a temporary crown better than me, so I'm going to make all my own temporary crowns. Um, nobody can take a photo as good as me, so I'm going to take all my photos. Um, and, and what I realized is I wasn't giving them the credit where credit was due. Like I had to teach them, and I had to get them to try something new, which was a challenge at times. But the time that that freed me up to then be able to manage the schedule better or to even manage the patient experience a little bit better um, took a major stress relief off. And it's, and it's little things so, you know, yeah. it's not like this, it's not like these, you know, somebody's expecting like, Oh, I just stopped working three days a week. And all of a sudden I am not at my max. No, right. it's little things like this that add up. And to me, it was just zapping my mental energy and kind of how you've told me before, you know, how do you stay in your circle? How do right. you, how do you stay where you need to be at a job that only you can do? When I started staying in my circle, and letting my front desk team handle what needed handled and letting assistants handle what needed handled all of a sudden it was freeing i was yeah. just like oh man like i feel like i've got more time in the day and we're actually seeing more patients and we're actually being more efficient yeah. so it was kind of counterintuitive to a way but again it's not the big things it's the little things that just add up right yeah can i go back go back to the photography thing so uh, you teach a lot of excellent photography. So percentage wise, how much photography do your assistants do versus what you do realistically for you? Okay. What would you say? So let me, let me give a little history on this too, because I would say pre pandemic, okay. I took 99% of my photos. What? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. All of them because I felt like I felt like I needed to be there to talk to the patient and to 
like start explaining things. And I was kind of diagnosing through the lens as I was taking the photos and I would do it at every new patient, every consult, every records appointment, every before and after, because I thought that's what the patient really, really wanted. Right. And, um, I finally had an assistant who actually kind of challenged me on it a little bit. She came from an office where they did take photos. Um, and she said, why, well, you know, we're so busy. Like this is something that we can do. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. So I started training them and then it got to the point. I mean, now don't get me wrong. It took some training. It wasn't right. automatically, but now I'm to the point to where I take the before photos to any large case yeah. and I take the after photos. And so in the grand scheme of my day of the photos that I take, they probably take 75% of my photos and I maybe take 25%. So that's, the number completely flip flopped. That's a great swing. And it just yeah. frees up hundreds and hundreds of hours. Yeah. And realistically, so I love what you're saying. Now, again, we're going to get to the topic here in a second, but this is the stuff I love most is like getting inside the mind of a great restorative dentist. Some people think, oh, that's going to take a long time, Zach, to teach my assistant to learn how to do this. But, you know, agree or disagree with me. They're going to do it really well. They're going to do it for every patient, not just a few patients. They're going to take all the photos, not just a few photos. They're actually going to take the photos off of the card and put it in the camera and just not leave. So how long of a learning curve are we talking about when you get the right assistant? Is it, I mean, is it several weeks? What are you thinking? Um, I think it's, it's a week or two of them learning the basics and how to kind of like get in position to do it okay. properly. And then after that first couple of weeks, it's just refining. Love you it. know, I would say, you know, we take a standard like 22, uh, 22 photo, photo series, photo set on, on a records patient. And so after the first probably two or three weeks where all I'm sitting there is saying, we need to take, we need to retake this one and this one. And my thing was, I, I didn't really like, if I was going to relinquish the control, I wanted somebody to be able to step in and handle it as well. I didn't want a bunch of crappy photos. And the first time um, that, you know, this other assistant kind of challenged me on it, she said, I, I'd like to try to start taking photos. She took them and I was like, these are not up to my standard. And mm -hmm. I was like, so if you can come to that standard, I'm happy to let you do this. Yeah. It's like, but we have to be at a certain standard. We hold everybody around here to a certain standard, including myself. So here's the thing. Like, uh, you know, I had a, a mentor once tell me, when, once you accept a bad impression, a photo or whatever that is, you've just set the new bar. You've yes. just set the new standard. So to me, if you hit 22 photos and there's like two of them that are just aren't quite right, take them again. Like that's mm -hmm. the power of digital photography is that I can delete it in a second and take a new one. I'm not waiting 48 hours for film mm -hmm. to get turned over to find out it's bad. I'm just going to take it again. And so I had to, that was one thing where I had to stay a little bit more on top of things and just say, no, we're not letting this slide. Like you're going to show me your best and you're going to do the best you can given the patient. Um, because otherwise I'm going to step back in and start doing this. And once they did take ownership of it, they didn't, they didn't really need me to step back in and take ownership of it. So. I love it. I love it. So if you guys are listening, man, that is a huge tip right there because again, you're freeing up thousands and thousands of hours that you can put your energy. And you know, the other thing I would, I would say is, you know, don't ever tell yourself, it's like you were pointing to, don't ever tell yourself you don't have smart people around you. You do, you know, you just got to give them the opportunity and clear lines of sight. Now go back to this too. You said there were, did you say there were three things? I'm taking notes at home. You said the office email, giving your assistants uh, more to do. And was there a third or not? It's okay if there isn't. I don't that freed remember. up some time. That's okay. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. I, what you guys don't know as listeners or watchers of this is I collect all this stuff. I, this is not just a show where I ask people questions. I actually collect stuff. I'm a collector of the best thought processes. So you guys keep showing up. You're going to see one of these days I'm going to type up all these notes. Actually, we do. They're called show notes. And you can actually cut and paste them yourself right into your own documents. Now let's go back to the... You're gonna, and you're going to sell a book. I'm going to sell a book. I've got, I got actually, everybody's secrets. So right here. They're I'm right just going to cut it. And I'll tell you, I'm going to sell the book. <laughs> I'm going to cut and paste my own notes that are on the Act Dental website and publish the book. So you could probably do it faster than 
me if you wanted to. <laughs> but that's what this whole thing is about, is like sharing the secrets of the whole world. Now, let's go back to the task at hand. So when you talk about trying something new, you actually have a framework underneath that. So if I'm a young dentist, why am I not trying something new? You have three components that you were thinking usually, and it applied to you when I talk about this journey of Very changing. Much so. Very much so. Um, so to me, I always, again, still challenging myself to why am I not trying something new or what can I do different or how can I, how can I try something new to keep it fun and exciting? Um, early on, to young dentists, I think that, I guess this isn't a topic really just for young dentists, it's for dentists all across the spectrum. But early on, I feel like there were kind of three ways as I look back and why I wouldn't try something new or why when I talk to other dentists, they don't want to try something new. And the first one would be, you know, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, well, okay, what don't you know? I, I just don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that procedure. So I refer that procedure out. I'm like, okay. Well, there's courses all over that you could go and actually obtain the knowledge right. to learn how to do this. And then maybe you keep more stuff in your office or maybe you decide that, um, hey, I tried this and I actually like doing it. So maybe I want to dive deeper into that and find more CE on that and learn more about that and then apply more of that to my practice. So to me, it's like the knowledge excuse is kind of a cop out. Right. And I'm sitting there like, you know, there's plenty of avenues, whether it be a course, whether it be a mentor, whether it be um, reading out of a textbook or journals or whatever, you can find knowledge to apply. Right. So that's kind of on you if you're not willing to at least seek out some of this knowledge to, you know, find a way to succeed. Yeah. And then, but, and then you and I, you mentioned atomic habits. Like, uh, if you're a listener, like, tell me about this, Zach. Like, sometimes you don't always need to be looking for the house. Sometimes you just got to have your brain set in an automatic habit. Like, I love books. I'm usually listening to a podcast or a book every single morning I come in. Uh, my friends all suggest books. I get them immediately, and I have them all lined up. And I'm not like a super diligent person about getting through each one of them. Frank Spears said years ago, he said, Kirk, don't get through books. Get from books. I'm like, what the heck does that mean? He's like, I'm trying to read three books at one time. I'm like, what? He's like, no, like a lot of people try to get through books. He said, just try to gather some knowledge. And for me, that spoke to like, just be open, be open and put your brain in a fertile environment that's just capturing some of this stuff by osmosis. And a lot of times, Zach, do you agree? You can hurdle the how. Like you start to see farther when you, the book isn't about the information. I've read tra Traction 20 times. The book doesn't change. My brain changes every time. You know what I mean? Like, would you agree with that? No, absolutely. And I think it kind of going back to the Atomic Habits book and just, I'm not saying, they're saying, look, I'm not, um, I don't set a goal to read 12 books in a year because I just want to read 12 books. I want to be identified as a reader, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't, I don't attend every cosmetic dentistry CE event under the sun because right. I want to know all that stuff. No, I want to be identified as a cosmetic dentist because I can take what I've learned and actually apply it. Yeah. So interestingly enough, you bring up the book um, reference because last year that was my goal. As I started, I, I wanted to, I, reading is very much a weakness for me. I don't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I struggle to get, quote unquote, through books. You know, um, they really have to capture my attention. And so I set a goal. I was going to read 12 books last year. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to read a book a month. And that's a lot for me. Yeah. Um, but as I started reading, I found what I liked and I found what I didn't like. And I found what captivated me and kept me really engaged. And I found books that like, oh, man, I don't want to pick up another one like this. Yeah. But had I not at least even set the goal, had I not even tried that, I wouldn't have known what I liked and what did I wanted to read more of and what I wanted to kind of learn more about. Because to me, as I slowly, again, I, I didn't set the goal with the intention of being a reader. I set it as, oh, this is a weakness of mine. I need to strengthen it. But as I got through it and I was getting more from these books, I was able to say, okay, I'm a reader. Like yeah. I know how to do this now. You know, yeah. like this is a, this is a part of my life. And I really, I started, I basically cut out pretty much all TV. Um, we watch very, very little TV other than like 
and Kanto or yeah. cars on Disney. Yeah. Um, but to me, that was starting something new and realizing like really how to dive into it and really what I liked from it. And I've done the same thing in dentistry too. Like I, you know, did a lot of CE on TMJ and liked it initially. And then when I started treating it, I realized it's a complex onion with many, many layers. And I dove deeper down that route and saw what I wanted to take and what I wanted to utilize. And then I did airway CE and I learned like, okay, I, I'm not a real, this isn't something I love, but I know people who do. And I'd love to get my patients in their passionate hands of they care. They, they're, they're really all about that. Yeah. And then I found the more as I started going down other avenues that I really love aesthetics. I really like implants. I really like those sorts of things. So it just helped me evolve as I was kind of going along. And now I'm like, okay, I'm becoming a more well-rounded dentist in that sense because I went down some of these pathways to figure out what worked and what didn't. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So, you know, and this show is all about helping. So like I interviewed somebody, I don't know, this is years ago and this is so great. So Zach, I bet you if we had a competition to finish 12 books in a year, you would beat me by a long shot. Now <laughs> I, I try something new, which helps. And it's this is that whenever, so I just had somebody recommend a book to me and I down, I always, here's my system and I'm sharing it with you and everybody that's listening. So whenever I get a book, it, it comes from, like, you got to read this. I do two things. I buy the book immediately and I download it on Audible. Now, I'll cheat. Here's what I mean by cheat. I listen to the first two chapters in Audible. And if it's garbage, because I've read a lot of books, I'm like, make your point. You're talking about this elephant in the woods and it goes up the hill. And it's seven pages of the w elephant in the woods that goes up the hill. Well, like, to, to say one sentence at the end. It's got to capture me in the two first chapters or, or I just put the book aside. Now, the other thing you got to tell yourself is never begrudge the money you spend on education. To spend $12 on a book that's an audio and paper, don't tell yourself 24 bucks. No, you're going to get way more than 24 bucks just sticking to the system. So I actually just, uh, we mentioned this book last time, Die With Zero. So like uh, I have the book, I've, I've already started it on Audible and I like it. So now I've got the actual written copy of what I'm listening to. And then I go back and so I don't really read the book through and through. So I don't know if this helps anybody, but like I'm on the go like you, I'm on the yeah. move. And there are times where I'm sitting outside of a gym and I was doing it uh, last night, my son, uh, uh, outside practice. And I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm 10 minutes early. You know what I mean? So I'll just turn on the book and keep going with that. So we're all about helping here. Now, Zach, going to number two, when you say, so number one is they don't know how. So that kind of stops people from doing something yeah. new. What's number two? I think a lot of times when I've talked to other dentists, they'll say, you know, look, I'm just kind of scared to do that. Like it just, I'm scared I'll mess up or I'm scared. Mm -hmm. Like I'll, I'll fail at doing it. And my, my response is always kind of like, well, yeah, but what if it goes right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what if it works? You yeah. know, like then it could be awesome. And they're like, yeah, but what if it doesn't? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Okay, Give us an is... example that you were like scared to try it until you did it in your practice. Like anything come to mind like at all? Oh. Yeah, the first With insurances time. or anything, or even raising your fees. Like you're really good about talking about fees. Were you ever terrified when you're like, I got to tell the patient what this is going to cost? Like, yeah, I, that was something, but I think the first time I was most scared was when I sat down to do my first veneer case, because mm -hmm. like I sat down and I had the knowledge, like I had done all the courses and I had done all that. But this was the first time that somebody was getting ready to pay a substantial <laughs> fee for the work that I was doing. And I'm sitting there thinking like, oh man, I got to make this perfect. Like right. this has got to be, everything's got to be every I dot, every T crossed, everything's got to be smooth. Everything's got to be polished. And I mean, I poured my heart and soul into that that day. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, like I thought, man, this went really, really well. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, I look back at photos and I'm like, oh my goodness, like mm -hmm. that was not really, really well. But when I look back, I said, I had to start somewhere. Yeah. And that patient was still thrilled beyond belief. I can still sit here and pick it apart for every little thing that I would like to change and do that, but I can do that with any case. Yeah. So to me, when I was scared, I was like, okay, I have the knowledge. Like I have all these systems. I'd, I probably had way more than I would ever have going into a case right now, as far as like prep guides and matrices and temporary materials and all this other stuff. But that's what gave me the confidence to kind of be willing to try it. Right. So, you know, and my thing 
and my assistants will tell me this all the time. They're like, you're just not scared to fail. And I was like, what do you mean? And they'll say, well, you'll just get in and start doing something. And if something goes sideways, like, well, you'll figure it out. I was like, yeah. well, what other option do I have? Don't. I said, if I'm going to approach it with that mentality, like I'm just going to have to figure it out. And there's going to be times that fail and there's going to be times that it goes awesome. And you're going to be like, dang, like that, that is actually pretty cool. Yeah. But I think a lot of times people are so scared of the failure component that they're just not even willing to kind of get in the game and try it. And right. that, that to me, like I said this in the last podcast is like, you know, success can be a very, very lousy teacher when yeah. everything is good. What does that mean? Me, Explain that. Well, I mean, if everything's always going good and everything you do, everything you touch is gold and everything goes along smoothly and you always run on time and you're, you know, you never run into a single snag. How do you ever learn that you could be better? Like you already think you're the best there could be. But failure is what kind of teaches you really. I mean, success is a lousy teacher. Failure is a great teacher because yeah. when you're in the midst of a failure, you have to really analyze things and look at it and figure out ways around it to get out of the failure and to get back to the success. So it sometimes in a way makes success even a little bit more sweet mm -hmm. because if you've gone through the hard times to make it to the good times, it's actually more rewarding. Yeah. But failure to me a lot of times is a great way to learn. I mean, there've been many a times where because I've done one procedure so long and so long and so long, you just kind of get used to it and it's routine. But now I've done that procedure so many times, even if it's like a simple filling, when you run into a snag or you run into something that's hard, like you know how to adapt and move. If I've never had those struggles before, how do I ever be able to, how am I ever able to adapt and move based on the fly of what's going on in the chair or what's going on with a patient or managing a patient expectation? You know, you need those failures in my opinion as, as much as they suck to go through and like yeah. nobody likes it. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, yeah, I might be willing to jump in and try something, but I don't want to fail. Yeah. But I realize that when I do, there's more to be learned and more to be learned from the failure. I mean, to totally agree. Now, when you said, um, you know, Failure. There's two components to this: scared to do it, and then you know the reality that you might fail. Let's talk about. Can we dissect the fear a little bit? So I'm going to use the cliche thing that dentists are afraid of rejection. I want to get inside the mind of a great restorative dentist. Is that true? Like, how true is it? Like, is that is that is that the biggest component of this fear? Like, what what are well, your let's, thoughts? Let's, let's let's say it's not even a dentist. I mean. Do right. you like feeling rejected? I hate it. I get exactly, sweaty. Right? I'm a wuss. I want everyone to get along. I get nervous. <laughs> I start to shake. No, I'm serious. Like fear of no. rejection was a huge thing. I didn't want anyone to fight. I want everybody to like me. And so it caused more problems ultimately for me because I go, no, it's not a problem. And it was a huge problem or no, yeah. not a big deal. And, you know, so uh, there's a certain point where you've got to be a little aware. For So I'm not a great person to ask this question. I, 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 I'm a wuss. I've been clinically diagnosed as a wuss, but from your perspective, what are your thoughts? But that's what I mean is that that makes the point is like, nobody likes rejection. No. Like whether you're a dentist, whether you do practice management, whether you're a server at a restaurant, whether you're an attorney, nobody likes that. Right. But there's always the element that anytime I make a decision, rejection's an option or failure's mm -hmm. an option. You know, so I present patient, I present treatment to a patient. There's all of this chance they can say no. And early on in my career, oh man, I would take that so hard. Right. It's like, they don't like me. Like I did something wrong. It's like, no, you know what? Maybe it just doesn't fit in their life right now. Like right. you got to stop taking it so personally and see it from a more objective standpoint. Mm -hmm. And for some people it's very hard. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a D on the disc scale. So it's a little bit easier for me to see that, but, um, take my, my wife for an example, she's an S so mm -hmm. she does not like that. She will, um, not respond as easily to it. She can't brush it off as easy. Yeah. So everybody's going to accept it and kind of, um, respond to it differently. Mm -hmm. But I guess my key with that is saying, I'm at least going to get in the game to have the option to be rejected rather than just sit on the sidelines and never actually know 
if they would have said yes. Yeah. Because when it comes to treatment planning, I mean, I think that's where a lot of dentists start to hang themselves up. So they're like, oh, that patient will never say, they'll, they'll never say yes. Oh, they'll never want that. Like that's, I'm just not even going to bring it up. Yeah. I'm like, no, you're just a little scared of rejection because you don't know who wants it. Like we don't, we don't judge anybody that walks in our office because we've had 95 year old people come in, want their smile redone. And we're like, okay, like yeah. this is, I, I, I could have said like, oh, you're 95. Why would you want to do this? But they're the ones who want it done. So like, who is it me to judge to even say that? But again, I could have set myself up for rejection or maybe, hey, let's look positively. I actually set myself up for success. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying too. And so, you know, this as a parent, like you're always using these moments. So you guys can try this. This is so cool. So we'll go into California Pizza Kitchen, which is one of our favorite places to eat. Cause I, and then you'll see they've shut down that section over there. They're all cleaning up and they've got only the section going. I'll walk in and I'll say, can I have that table right over there, which is that corner? And my wife will go, why are you? Oh my gosh, they have shut. <laughs> and I say to the kids, I say to everybody, you never get what you don't ask for. And they're like, dad, this is so embarrassing. And sure enough, what does the lady do? Absolutely. She walks us right over there. And I'm like, you guys, this is such a great lesson because I used to be afraid to ask for things. Could you imagine? Like when I, I always tell the kids this, your mom was so hot when she was so beautiful when I saw her. I was like, there's no way she's even going to talk to me. Could you imagine if I would ever said, hi, you know, I'm, I can't remember what I said, but it was terrible. Like everything in life, there are going to be some things that people say no to, but like try with little things, whether it be asking for a table, like even when it comes to going to, a game or anything like I'll like a Bucks game. I'll go, we're going to sit right there. There's nobody. Can we sit here? And people go, yeah. I'm like, my kids are like, what are we doing? You, know, you never get what you don't ask for. And it happens in dentistry too. Your first veneer case, you probably said, well, here's the fee. And they go, okay. And you went, what'd you say? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't even believe you just said yes. Now I got to do the dentistry. And that keeps happening over and over again. So you got to feel okay. the fear and do it anyway. Right. We have a, we have a similar saying with our kids, um, like you do with yours. And we say, the worst I can say is no. Absolutely. I mean, you, can ask, you can ask for anything. The worst I can say is no. I mean, so of course they ask every single night for a snack. <laughs> yeah. And you know, some days, some days maybe I'm feeling pretty good and Hey, yeah, let's have a snack. But yeah. most of the time it's no, but you no. know what? If they didn't ask, they might've not have got the Hershey bar that they wanted before. Bed. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it works. I love it. I love it. What's the third thing you think present, you know, presents itself that dentists don't try something new. The third thing I, I went, I wrestled with this myself and even wrestled with it even more recently. But the third thing I think is that it's beat into our brains as dentists that whatever we do will never be good enough. So they're like, what's the point in trying? Like, it's never going to be good enough. Okay. I, where does that come from though? Like, give me, give me the root of that. You know, well, is so it I the think, psychology the of, of dental goes, school or what is it? I think the root of it goes deeper than dental school, but it's very prevalent in dental school. So to me, us as a society, if I have a hundred question exam and I make a 99 on it, what do most people say? Why didn't you ah. get a hundred? Missed, missed that one, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I missed one, but I made 99 of them, right? Mm -hmm. So like, why is it that we always have to focus on the one little negative? Like mm -hmm. we did 99% of this job really, really well. We got 99% right. But our default almost as a society, or maybe it's just where I live, might not be where any of you all live, but we're always quick to say, <laughs> but what about that? Mm -hmm. Oh, but what about that one? What about this point? So when you get to dental school, you know, a lot of times you're working on fake teeth and, you know, you're getting graded on that. And so, of course, the, the professor can literally take the tooth out of the dental form and hold it in every which angle and say, well, you see this one little corner here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not quite smooth enough. We need to round that a little bit more. I'm like, if this was in the mouth, there was no way you would even be able to see that angle, but you're pulling it out of a dental form and spinning it. Like, like trying to keep it in the context of the situation. Right. So when I look at that, I'm like, okay, <clears throat> everything we did in dental school, you got graded on. So it was always, you know, ABC, whatever in clinic, everything you did was graded on. And they were always trying to tell you how to make it better, how to make it better, how to make it better. And I think 
in their attempts to make it seem like, no, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to coach you along to make you better. I think it comes across a lot of times as it's never good enough. Like you're not, you're, you're not going to be able to actually make this perfect. You can strive for it all you want, but you're not going to be good enough. And so I think a lot of times dentists take it very, very hard um, on themselves when that kind of happens. You know, if there's a failure, oh, it's my fault. It's all my fault. Well, no, not necessarily, you know, like the patient maybe didn't brush their tooth or maybe they bit down on something the wrong way and broke it. Like it's, it is their tooth. I'm just here to help them with that. Right. But then the other aspect here, even later in my career. So I just got, um, I just went through the accreditation process with the AACD and everything's graded again. And you know, it's, um, dental school times a thousand, let's say, and you sit there and you put up your work that you have poured your heart and soul into that a patient maybe is thrilled by and you can sit there and let them just shred it apart. Right. Now I do fully, I do fully and wholeheartedly believe that the people who are trying to mentor people along like myself going through the process are trying to help you get better. I do not think they do it in a malicious way or at least none of my mentors did that to me. Right. But it's one of those other factors where, ah, it just could have been better. It just could have been better. I'm like, you know what? It could have been, but that patient right there is really, really happy. And guess yeah. what? They've sent three patients to the practice from that. Yeah. So I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater here because I'm sitting here looking at like, they always say, you know, look, I'm striving for perfection to be able to fall into the zone of excellence. Yeah. So when you get the 99 out of 100, it's like, dang, you did really awesome on that. Way to go. You got 99 right. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Not, ah, what happened to the one? What's the one you missed? Yeah. Can you remember? I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to focus on the the positive aspect rather than the negative aspect. So yeah, a lot I of love times this. when so when they're, you know, when people are sitting there kind of like, you know, yeah, it's been beat in my head this way. Oh, it's my choice to see how I want to see it. Yeah. And so one thing I talk about a lot of times, even when it comes to aesthetic is uh, aesthetics is how am I going to frame this situation? Like I can't necessarily control what happens to me. I can't control the situation that happened, but I can control how I frame it. Yeah. And I can either frame it in a really negative light and beat myself down and tear myself apart and say how I could have done better or I can shift the frame and say, hey, look, we did an awesome job here. It's not perfect. I'm fine with not being perfect because nothing yeah. never is. And I've got a really happy patient in the end of this. So when I, and, and I'm, and I'm hard on myself about this as well. Like I sometimes want to let that frame slide over to the negative side. I'm like, nope, don't do it. Right. Don't even go there. Like just slide it over to the positive and try to stay positive when you're going through some of this. Cause you can always, I mean, if you're negative enough, you can always talk yourself out of trying anything. Yeah, absolutely. I love what you're saying. And I heard somebody say this not too long ago. You got to be careful with self-talk. Self-talk is 80% negative. So you don't want to be talking to yourself a lot. And then the great Bill Lockhart, I met him in his 60s when he had just retired. And he said, Kirk, I want you to hear something. You know, perfection is actually very deadly. It's dangerous in dentistry. He said, the way I looked at it in my career is excellence was my job. Perfection was God's job. There were days where it was perfect, but it wasn't my doing. I just gave everything I had to it. And it ended up being perfect, but it wasn't my doing. Now, help me reconcile this, because I've talked to many great restorative dentists about this concept. Sometimes done is better than perfect or ideal. Help me reconcile the two because you don't want to be too far on the, I'm just getting it done. You know, where, where do I find myself in that spectrum? How do you find yourself in that spectrum of done and ideal? I guess I heard, I can't remember what this was called. I mean, it was, it was something odd, like the sham guard code or something like that. Okay. Somebody told me about this and he said, I did the best I could with the situation at hand in the, in the environment I had. So I'm saying, you know, like if I'm working on a kid and I'm trying to just get the filling in place and get the cavity out of there or get the pulpotomy done and get them feeling better, like done is better than perfection in that standpoint. We save this kid's tooth. We were able to kind of keep it there for the long term and until it exfoliates naturally. Yeah. But 
the other side of it is the veneer case because a lot of my patients are more of an older clientele where we're doing a lot of functional rehab kind of stuff where done versus perfect is I was able to save this person's teeth with maybe some composite and some few crowns Mm -hmm. versus, Hey, you know what? It's not Hollywood movie star white. And I didn't get to do every single tooth, but you know what I did do? I kept the teeth around so that if someday they need to go into an assisted living community, they can still chew their food and it's not getting put up in a blender for them. Yeah. Or they didn't lose their dentures because we let things just go by the wayside. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's where the done versus the perfect kind of comes into play. And I think, I, I won't say that I have this down perfectly at all in my mind, again, because perfection is can't be yeah. cheap. But I will say that because of where I practice and where I'm at, I feel like there's just this sense of reality um, where not everybody comes in and wants the brightest shade on the shade tab. They just want, uh, I, I did a, I did a uh, rehab last month where the guy says, Hey, look, I want steak over shade. He said, I don't care what color they are, but I want to be able to choose steak with them. And I, I love like, it. Oh. Yeah. And I'm like, so I think there's a sense of realism there to where, People are like, look, I'm not looking for perfection. Yeah. I'm looking for a really good job. I don't want, I don't want like sloppy work or anything being done. But I realize that you're not perfect and neither am I. So I, I guess I have some patients or my patient population tends to provide me with some grace. Mm-hmm. So when I'm given grace, I hope that I can also give it to somebody else when something doesn't go perfectly uh, in my life outside of the office. So yeah. Yeah, I love it. Maybe long-winded way of saying it. but I love it. And you and I are going to cover a lot of topics on different things. And this is a huge one, a very important one. Any last thoughts, if I'm a young dentist listening, on why I should keep trying something new? And I'll introduce this thought. If you're trying something new and you're hearing the seven most expensive words in business consistently, use that as a cue. When people are using the seven most expensive words, which are, that's the way we've always done it, that should trigger something for you to go, okay, that's not a good reason to do anything. Well, what are your thoughts? Any last words of wisdom on trying things that are new? Um, I think if you're going to try something new, again, I would just say shoot your shot and don't be afraid to try. Mm Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, there's a chance you're going to miss. But, hey, there's also a chance you're going to make it. And, you you know, what's the old John Wooden quote? Like, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. Yeah. So I'm at least going to throw the ball up in the air and see if I can make the shot rather than just never try. Absolutely. I mean, because it, it could turn out to be something really, really great. But you've got to be willing to take that shot. I love it. I love it. And we're going to have you back. We're going to talk about some clinical dentistry, photography, and other things. But, Zach, I want people to be able to see where you're at. If I want to learn more about what Zach Sisler is doing, and I'll just tell you guys, you got to follow him on his social media. It's pretty cool. I'm the worst at social media, but, like, you've got some pretty cool stuff. Tell us what you're up to. How do I find out more about what you're doing? Um, so, if, uh, you reach out to me on social media. Again, uh, Instagram is my main form of communication. Uh, dr underscore Zach Sisler, um, and feel free to DM me, ask questions. I'm happy to respond. Um, the other thing that we do in our office is if you want to reach out, uh, go to drsisler.com and there's a four dentist tab in our office. We, um, offer CE courses on photography as well as like an over the shoulder experience where people can come in and literally watch my team and I prep a case of porcelain veneers and then, excuse me, deliver a case of porcelain veneers. So it's a really cool way where we keep it to a small group environment of like 10 docs to come in and be able to experience that. And then we also get to change the lives of two patients. Cause to me, I'm not here to just be a dentist. I'm here to like change the lives of people I interact with. So I want to interact and engage with as many people as I possibly can. So again, drsisler.com and go to the four dentist tab and shoot us an email um, and we're, we'll get right back in touch with you. 
Dude, you're the best. You are making things happen and influencing a lot of lives positively. So I love it. And so uh, I'm going to have, I'm going to voluntold you. See how you do that? Voluntold you to come back. You, you don't have an option. So <laughs> that's how it works. So stick around while I say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. If you enjoyed today, like I know you did, do us a favor and hit the share button. Share this episode with your friends. And hey, if you enjoy today, I'm also going to ask a favor of you. Leave a four or five star review, hopefully a five star review because what it allows us to do is find other people like you. We love this profession so much that we would love to help your friends and all the new and upcoming dentists because this profession is an awesome profession. And so until we see you guys next time, keep watching or keep listening to The Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. 